John Hart. I'm the co-founder of C3 Solutions. That stands for the Conservative Coalition for Climate Solutions. And today, we have a very special guest for our Right Voices series. A former U.S. Senator, presidential candidate, uh, Rick Santorum is here with us. Rick is one of our advisors at C3 Solutions. We're, we're very honored to have him on our board. And uh, Rick, there's a lot. Uh, there's a lot to talk about. <laughs> there's a lot happening in American politics. Yeah. There's a lot of elephants in the room. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about all those things. But but to start, I want to give kind of our viewers and listeners uh, just some frame of reference and uh, and some context. So so why does Rick Santorum care about the environment? Why don't we start there? Well, uh, gosh, everybody should care about the environment. I mean, that's where we live. Uh, the idea that it, that the the left seems to try to perpetrate is that you know conservatives and Republicans don't care about the environment. But uh, you know, if you go back in the Republican Party, I mean, you know, I, I know in Pennsylvania, for example, for example, uh, Gifford Pinchot, uh, governor of uh, of uh, Pennsylvania during uh, the turn of the last century. Uh, was famous in setting up national, I mean, state parks and and doing uh, all sorts of environmental uh, you know, benefits to, because Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania means Penn's Woods. That's what Pennsylvania means, Penn's Woods. And Pennsylvania was entirely woods. I mean, it was just trees everywhere. And it was pretty much clear cut uh, over, you know, uh, the first couple hundred years. And uh, so, so, Pinchot, Teddy Roosevelt, another one. Uh, they, you know, they saw the the the, uh, the necessity to for government to step in and preserve a very critical, uh, you know, natural phenomena and or forest, uh, whatever the case may be. So, uh, you know, the Republican Party has a long history in this, and you know, I'm someone who uh, who sh who believes we have to you know, we have to be good stewards of our of our environment. I mean, that's. You know, the, the Lord said, you know, I'm a, I'm a Catholic and believing and and, you know, he said, you know, you have dominion over the earth. That's what he says in the Old Testament, I mean, you know, and that means that you have you have responsibility for that. And and so we have to take that responsibility seriously. And the and the uh, the adage that you should leave things better than you found them, uh, which is something that conservatives believe right to conserve and to, uh, to, to take what you have and, and try to make it better for the next generation uh, while conserving what, what, is, what is good about, about your current situation. That's exactly what you know, good stewards of the environment should do. So I know it's a long answer, but uh, you know, I get a little miffed when people seem to suggest that somehow or another, you know, we don't care. Uh, we just believe that there are efficient and, and, and really good ways of, of preserving the environment and at the same time having a, uh, uh, you know, a strong and healthy economy and, and, and quality of life. Uh, we can do both. It's not one or the other. Well, and Ricky, you, you share a little bit about your personal life. I mean, you, you have land. Uh, tell our tell our viewers and listeners what you do in your life. Yeah, I mean, uh, I I just put in a a new hive of bees, uh, so I'm a, I'm a beekeeper, uh, which I I thoroughly enjoy. I love my little girls, and that's all the bees that produce honey. Anyway, are 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 female female bees. Uh, the guys are sort of worthless in the hive by and large, uh, and uh, so I I have uh, I have uh, a beehive, and I've, I've been a beekeeper. Uh, off and on for probably 10, 12 years now. Uh, and, you know, I've gotten honey many, many years and uh, I've, I've dealt with what beekeepers deal with, which is something called Connolly, Connolly Collapse Disorder. Uh, and, you know, have, have been uh, sort of somewhat active on that area and making sure that we don't have pesticides and other things that, that can uh, destroy bees, uh, which are essential for our pollination, for our, for our survival. So uh, I, I sort of feel like I'm contributing my little piece by having uh, my own little hive. Uh, I, I have, a, uh, we have five acres where, where we live and I have about 45 fruit trees, everything from apples to peaches to pears to sweet and tart cherries and plums. And uh, so I, 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 I grow blueberries and raspberries and marion berries and, you know, so I, I I love, you know, uh, growing and, and gardening and taking care of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the world around me, if you will, and trying to make it productive and beautiful at the same time. So uh, that's, that's a, a passion of mine. I got it from my grandfather who came over from the old country, Italy, and had his own little plot of garden and 
had a couple of fruit trees. And, and so when I was a little kid, I used to go out in the garden and garden with him. And, uh, and, you know, you, you just did the same thing with my kids. So you try to pass on, you know, the importance of, uh, of your connection with nature, your connect, you know, where does our, if food doesn't come from the grocery store, right? It comes from people grow it and produce it and you have to do so responsibly. Yeah. And have you, have you turned that into a business? Do you sell your honey or sell? Your uh, no, I, I, I give it away. Uh, I, you know, I, I usually it's, it, it, my wife says they're expensive Christmas gifts, but, uh, we, you know, we have, uh, uh we have lots of relatives, nieces, nephews, things like that. And so, uh, we always give uh, a couple of jars of jam. We make jam from, uh, from that. So we can keep it preserved sometimes too. And so we, uh, uh, we give those away for, for gifts and Christmas and little special occasions. So that's, uh, that's how we, uh, we, we take, cause it's, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of fruit trees, so you can't eat it all fresh. So you have to do something to keep it working for the long term. So that's what we did. That's fantastic. And also you, and you've done work internationally as well on, on uh, some different, different projects. Do you want to? Yeah, I'm actually very involved on uh, a couple of uh, companies that are uh, green energy companies. One is, uh, one is a, uh, a really tremendous innovation uh, having to do with uh, wind, solar wind, uh, which is uh, taking uh, a heat, a hot air, uh, running it through a, um, a tower, if you will, to, uh, to create wind downdraft and uh, power turbines and, you know, a completely green solution. I mean, all you do is you, you, you need some water. Uh, but other than that, I mean, there's, uh, it's, a, it's using the, the, the forces of nature to create energy and, and doing so in a very, very efficient way. So I've been involved with that company for about five or six years. Uh, not heavily, but involved in, in helping uh, move that company forward. I've been very much, much more involved, deeply involved with a company that's a waste energy company so trying to solve two problems. Uh, actually, you might say three problems, uh, but uh, we're trying to solve the waste problem, which is, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the number of landfills that we have in this country, uh, the groundwater pollution that comes, methane, you know, which with the environmental uh, groups called the, the planet killer, because it's, you know, almost a hundred times more uh, greenhouse, uh, has more greenhouse uh, 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 properties than, than CO2. So it's a much more dangerous uh, uh, gas for the atmosphere. And yet uh, landfills all over the world are emitting it at alarming rates. And you see a lot of effort trying to, to, uh, uh, to, do something about landfills. Well, we have a technology that can actually take, uh, you know, mine landfills, not just uh, take garbage and turn it into uh, a, a, a green fuel, but also, uh, in which I'm saying garbage, municipal waste, commercial waste, things like that. But also, uh, we could set these machines up at, at landfills and actually empty out landfills. So get rid of methane gas, if you will. So there's you know, we can solve the, the uh, deal with the climate problem, deal with, you know, groundwater, you can deal with, um, you know, clean, green energy to substitute for fossil fuels. So we, we feel like plastics, one of the things that our, uh, uh, our process uses, we can take, you know, plastics and recycle them. So there's, there's all sorts of great things that, that, that I'm working on. And, and again, I, 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 going back to the point I made earlier, which is, I want to make sure that the environment is, you know, we, we have a good environment for, for my children and, and their children and going forward. Uh, and I believe, as America has shown repeatedly, the best way to do that is through innovation, technology, and, and really good ideas that, that work to, uh, to solve problems and make profits at the same time. I mean, that's because that makes it a viable solution going forward. If it's not profitable, if it's, if it's, if it's something that's a, it's a cost, uh, then, then it, it, it tends not to be viable, particularly if, I mean, one of the beautiful things I take the third world, one of the exciting things that is our process actually can, can survive even in environments where uh, the economics of trash are not what they are in, 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 in the United States and Europe and other places like that uh, because of its efficiency. And if you didn't, if, it, if you couldn't do that, then it's going to take a lot of government dollars and, and international dollars to sort of support this process. And in the end, that makes it less viable going forward. Yeah, and last week we, we had a discussion with Nick Lawrence. Nick uh, is at the Heritage Foundation. He did a paper for us called Free Economies or Clean Economies. Yeah. And, and to your point, is he, what, what Nick found is he looked at 180 different 
countries using the, the index of, of economic uh, indicators. And he showed that there's a correlation between economic freedom and environmental performance. So roughly a free economy is going to be twice as clean as an unfree economy. And that's on our website, c3solutions.org. And you can read all about that. And you can read more about Rick's bio and our founding story. But you know, one thing I want to I want to set up from the beginning too is, you know, part of the reason you know we launched is is you know, Drew Bond worked for George Bush, Bush administration. I was Tom Coburn's longtime communications director. You know, our, our, our paths interacted a little bit, but mostly with staff, you know, Mark Rogers, who was your staff director. And, and one thing I really admire and appreciate about you, Rick, is, is you, you talk a lot about the work you do, um, but it's not an abstraction, is that you, you have given your life and dedicated your life to causes. And, and I've spent a lot of time with, 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 you know, political leaders, and you're the real deal behind the scenes. So I've spent, spent years working alongside you and others on healthcare reform. You know, Tom Coburn. Yeah, we had an alternative. Doctor Tom Coburn. <laughs> All right, right. We had a, we had an alternative to Obamacare. Yep. Before Obamacare was written, you know, and, and, and he we sadly we lost Coburn. You know, he he passed away a year and a half ago. Uh, you know, it left the Senate uh, before then. But there's a whole series of conservatives who work behind the scenes on this issue, and you've been uh, really relentless and. And part of the reason we launched is that, you know, I was leading some of the communication efforts on healthcare, but, you know, it's not enough to indict and critique the left. We have to offer our, our ideas and our solutions. Yeah. And you've been in the trenches on that. And now you've been, been willing to lend your credibility and experience in this environmental space. And I, and I remember at, after one of our meetings, I think we were talking about uh, one of the uh, alternatives that we had cooking. And we were walking along the street and, and we got into this discussion about, about bees and trees. And I just bought a 62 acre farm where I am now uh, near, uh, in, in Maryland, in Pleasant Valley, Maryland. So, uh, so and, I, I, and I remember distinctly how you just came alive, you know, when you started talking about your, your bees and your yeah. tree. So, uh, so it's really been, been a joy to kind of be on, on this journey with you. Um, you know, and this is a really challenging kind of troubled time, I think, for the GOP. And, you know, you're not just another former member. You nearly became our party's nominee in 2012. You were chairman of the Republican Conference, which is the, the, the senior communication role and leadership for six years. So you really have a lifetime of experience. And I wanted to really spend the rest of our time to give you the opportunity to speak into this moment we're in right now and to give your candid perspectives. And again, you know, we're a 501 c 3 you know, we're not a, we're not a partisan organization, uh, but we believe unapologetically in conservative principles. You know, our mission is to not, you know, just indict the Democrats or praise Republicans or to, to save Republicans from themselves. You know, we, we're here to advance ideas and solutions. Uh, and, uh, and I've been reading some of your previous work. You know, you wrote a book in 2014 called Blue Collar Conservatives. And, uh, and I think it was prophetic in many ways. I'm just going to read a section of that. In your introduction, you write that the United States must do everything it can to nurture the inventors and entrepreneurs who are the creative spirits of our free economy. And here the case for Republican policies is strong, but that's not enough. We Republicans must show the unemployed, the underemployed, and the struggling worker that we are on their side and want their support. We cannot forget the blue collar conservatives who are the backbone of this country. We have an obligation to restore the American dream for them and their families. And until we internalize this as a party, we will continue to lose national elections. So this was written before Donald Trump arrived on the scene. It was before he won a national election and it was before he lost the national election. So now we're in the midst of this discussion as a, as a movement. What is our future? What is your identity? So. What, just give us give us your candid assessment of, of kind of you know where we are in the moment, um, where where are we headed, where should we, we be headed, and um, what did what did Trump do well and what he what what did he not do well uh, with regard to your thesis and your and your vision? Yeah, I, well, first off, you know, Donald Trump and I had actually a discussion about my book uh, back in 2014. Uh, he reached out to me uh, after hearing me on a radio program in, in New York uh, back in the summer of 2014 after I published the book. 
and uh, asked me to come by and, and see him. Uh, I didn't know it was about the book, but uh, I walked into his office. He's sitting behind his desk and he's holding up a copy of my book and saying, uh, I read your book. And I walk, was walking in to shake his hand and I said, yeah, you, you didn't read my book. And he said, no, I, I, I read your book. It's a great book. And I said, yeah, yeah, the hell you read my book. And he, and he was very adamant that he had, he had read it. And we, we talked for about 10 minutes. I, I quizzed him on it. So whether he read it or whether he got someone to read it and give him cliff notes, I don't know which, but the bottom line is he was very, very passionate about it. And we spent the better part of an hour uh, talking about how uh, you know, the Republican Party uh, had to be an alternative to where the Democrats are going. And we both saw the socialist march that, that we, you know, we're now seeing from the progressives. And uh, he said, you know, someone's got to stand up for those, for you know, the, the, the folks that worked on my projects that, you know, he said he related to very, very well, who were, you know, construction workers and, and people who were left behind by Republicans who, in his mind, you know, wanted, you know, were, were involved with endless wars and were you know, kowtowing to China and, you know, uh, allowing uh, lots of unskilled workers coming in here, holding down wages. I mean, we we had all those discussions, believe it or not, uh, much of which were discussed in my book. And and so, uh, you know, I thought, you know, wow, I mean, you know, this guy's a true believer. And uh, I didn't think he was run for president, but but he ended up running for president and frankly did a much better job than I did in communicating that message and having candidly the opportunity to directly talk to the American people. Uh, I think it's one of the things that the mainstream media now, you know, kicks itself because they, when he was, uh, when he was running in 2016, you know, he was such a story and he was always, you know, creating news from every rally he had by, you know, saying something very controversial that, it, you know, they, they couldn't help but cover him. So they covered him live. And so, uh, the, he had the opportunity to speak directly to the American public. They could hear him unfiltered uh, by the national news media because they'd cover his events live. And he could talk about the things that I talked about in 2014, but no reporter ever covered. Uh, you know, I had a, I had a program that we, you know, was going to promote manufacturing, the whole, a whole section of the uh, new section of a tax code that was going to be incentives to, to bring manufacturing back here to this country. He didn't do exactly what I suggested, but, you know, he had, he, he talked about those things and, and, you know, directly communicated. And what, what Donald Trump and I, when we talked about it in 2014, both understood is that the Republican party had changed. Now, not the Republican Party, but the people who vote for Republicans has changed. Uh, I always remind people back when I got elected in, in 1994, you know, obviously 25 years ago, uh, I, I got elected by uh, losing the city of Philadelphia and then counteracting that by winning the suburban Philadelphia vote. Uh, and, and I would I, I try to hold my own in, uh, in sort of blue collar miners, construction workers, things like that, you know, not lose too badly and, and then pick it up in rural Pennsylvania. Uh, so that was, the, that was the key. Well, now you lose the city of Philadelphia, you lose the suburbs by almost as much as you lose the city of Philadelphia and you make it up in the blue collar areas all over Pennsylvania in, you know, in the Pittsburgh area and Scranton and Wilkes-Barre. And, and, and so all these folks who, Never worked, never voted for Republicans until the last. It wasn't Trump. I mean, it started happening well before Donald Trump. Trump just recognized it and then put the pedal to the metal. Uh, but the Republican voter had changed. That's why. That's why no one was excited about Mitt Romney or John McCain and and why they had such trouble winning. Because uh, and and frankly, why George Bush had trouble winning Pennsylvania because. He didn't connect with with uh, with working people and in, in a way that that Donald Trump did and and that so many politicians in Pennsylvania. Do. We and we control both the state house and state Senate by actually large margins, even though there are over a million more registered Democrats and Republicans. Why? Because we are we are a blue collar collar party in Pennsylvania and and it, and we're very proud of it. We're, we're very proud of our traditional values. We're very pr proud of. Of, of you know being out there working to make sure that uh, that you know we have training programs for people who need skills and I mean it's a it's a whole different ethic and uh, and I, I don't you know back in 2014 when I would go and and speak to the RNC and try to lecture them <laughs> about you know the party has changed you have it these are the people who are now willing to vote for us but they don't because we give them candidates that don't 
talk to them, don't seem to care about them. They recognized a long time ago that the Democratic Party has left them. That their, that their agenda is, this progressive agenda is, is a globalist agenda that, that is Marxist in, 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 its, in its underpinnings and that doesn't care about them or their values or their families. Uh, they don't care about the family. They don't care about uh, marriage. They don't care about uh, your, uh, your religious liberty. They don't care about the things that, that most uh, Americans, blue collar Americans care about. And, and so they've abandoned them. They've abandoned, uh, you know, other than the public employees unions, like the teachers unions, they've abandoned private sector unions. They, 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 you know, look at what the Keystone Pipeline uh, project did. I mean, again, those were all union jobs. They don't care. They, they, they don't care. They care about bigger agendas, progressive agendas. They don't care about people. Uh, and the, the dignity of, of, of the American worker. And, and we as Republicans have been in the same boat. I mean, I, I tell this story and uh, I'm sorry I've given this long answer, but this is sort of a passion of mine. But uh, I tell this story that I spoke at the Republican convention in 2012. Uh, and I remember it was, it, was, it was talking about businesses. That, that night was dedicated to, it was Tuesday night. And, um, and I sat back there and, and and right before I spoke, they, they trotted out one small business person after another. I mean, it was very impressive. They had men, they had women, they had people of color. Uh, it, it, was, it was quite an array. Uh, and they spent an hour plus talking about, you know, uh, how businesses create jobs. Because you may recall Obama said, you know, oh, you didn't, you didn't create that you job. Don't. You know, gov yeah, government did. And so they went out there and made that case. But you realize, John, through that entire hour or whatever it was that they had all these people come out, not one worker walked out on the stage with the employer, yeah. not one. And, and I, I remember sitting there saying, well, yeah, I mean, you did. I mean, obviously, you're the business person. You, you, you invested your risk, but you didn't do it alone. And, and why are we not talking to the people? You have one owner and you have dozens, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of employees. And we're talking to the one. I mean. What kind of strategy is that if you want to if you want to get your message across? And so I went out, you know, I went out and 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 talked about, you know, we have to talk about that's really one of the things that inspired me to write the book. We have to talk about the people. Uh, I say this in one of my chapters, a rising tide lifts all boats, mm -hmm. except if your boat is a hole in it, if you don't have the proper education or if you have problems at home or if you have addiction problems, you have and everybody has something. I mean, nobody gets through this world unscathed and so everybody has something everybody has a hole in their boat somewhere some are able to overcome it but others need more help and we have to recognize that as a party and understand that america is great because we have a solid core solid middle that has opportunity and can and can support their family and 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 support their community and neighborhood and libraries and schools and other things that make the community work for them and they're just as important as, as Bill Gates and, 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 and uh, Mark Zuckerberg. And, and we shouldn't just worry about the entrepreneur. We should worry about the people who make America tick. Yeah, and I remember 2012, I think that the defining postmortem stat was the, the caring gap. And you talk a lot about convincing people that you care about them. Yeah. And, and I, I, I can't remember the exact number, but the, the, the number of people who said Barack Obama cares about people like me versus Mitt Romney was like 63 point gap or some huge discrepancy. And, and that's really, really hard to win elections. Yeah, if I recall the stat, it was, if, if your number one issue, remember they talk about what's your number one issue, the economy. Well, if your number one issue is he cares about people like me, uh, my recollection was that, that Obama got 80% of those votes and Romney got less than 20. Uh, mm -hmm. it, 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 you, you, you know, one of the things I learned a long time ago from uh, in politics is people don't care what you think, uh, care what you know, until they know that you care. And uh, and that's true for uh, for blue collar workers. Frankly, it's true for people of color uh, that Republicans uh, don't seem to make a concerted and consistent effort to try to uh, show a connection with. I mean, we have we have a lot of we have a lot of warts as far as I'm concerned within the party that we've developed over time, and you know Donald Trump uh, went a long way in trying to in 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 uh, in transforming the party. Uh, you know he's a he's <laughs> I was going to say he's a bull in a china closet. He's really a T Rex in the china closet. I mean he's uh, he is uh, he's a he's a, a destructive force, uh, but 
the Republican Party needed that creative destruction uh, in, in, in transforming the party. Uh, it's just, you know, sort of like Moses not being able to get to the promised land. I mean, yeah, he got one election, but I think the, uh, the creative destruction continued and, and that, that's what probably cost him the election. Yeah, and why, so I think you've, you've laid out clearly why he did win because he he really took your he took your game plan and he, and he ran and said he had you know unique you know communication skills opportunities yeah he did it, like I say he did it far better than I yeah. did sure. yeah so so what was it why why did why did he not win a second term what 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 is Rick saying yeah, I, I think take I, on like I, why he didn't start to win a second term yeah I think it comes down to look if you go through and look at what Donald Trump accomplished. Uh, with the economy and and uh, with uh, with with frankly with minorities and uh, how how uh, the the economic lift. I mean, I uh, Tim Tim uh, uh, Scott shared this the other night at the uh, at, at his response to the uh, president's address. Uh, the bottom quarter of income earners in America, you know, saw their incomes rise, uh, while the top earners in America didn't during the Trump administration. I mean, that's something that the Democrats say they want to do, uh, and their idea is to tax the heck out of the people at the top and redistribute it to the people at the bottom. And, the, and, and what Trump said is, no, you just you, you have to create the proper incentives to make sure uh, that, that we, we have a lift at the bottom. And part of that uh, it was his tax policy. Part of it, frankly, was his immigration policy. Uh, part of it was his trade policy. I mean, if you look at all those things that, that he did, uh, you know, healthcare. I mean, there's a lot of things that Donald Trump did. He gets very little credit for, uh, but he did a lot. And and I think had that been the issue in the campaign, he'd have won. But the issue in the campaign was Donald Trump's persona. Uh, that's uh, sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, that's that's what that's what the problem was. Is is Donald Trump uh, was is a caustic figure that that. Yes, does he inspire great loyalty and 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 uh, support among his supporters? Yes, he does, but he provides equal uh, uh, energy on the other side. And and you know you saw that I know the census report just came out yesterday that this was the the biggest turnout elections uh, in uh, the second largest in the history of our country as a, a percentage of turnout since 1992. I mean that's. That's an, an, an amazing stat. And I know that it certainly wasn't Joe Biden that was motivating people to come out, but people came out either for or against Trump. And unfortunately, um, more people came out who didn't like Donald Trump and were tired of the drama and tired of, of Donald Trump just dominating their lives every single day. It just became too much for people. And it's sad because uh, he, had, he, he did a tremendous amount of good uh, he just did it in a way that turned a lot of people off. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, and candidly, like I was, I was for other candidates, you know, in 2016. Yeah, I was yeah, too. But, me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, obviously our, our number one choices didn't win. But, you know, I think there were, there are two kinds of Republicans after, after 2016 who didn't, who weren't big fans of Trump. I think those who wanted to be proven right and those who wanted to be proven wrong. And I unapologetically was in the latter camp. I was critical of Trump, but I wanted to be proven wrong. Yeah. And I sat with you and a lot of other people in meetings with, with administration officials to help them succeed. So I feel no regret about that. I feel no second thought about it. Uh, because I think as Americans, we should root for our president, you know, yeah. just as George Bush rooted for Bill Clinton. So 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 I, I so I asked this next question with no animus towards towards Trump, but when we, we look at the reality is the GOP right now, uh, it, uh, you tell me what you think as a former member of leadership. Are we orientated around principles or are we orientated around personality? Where do you think uh, we are? <clears throat> I, think, I think the vast majority of Republicans are, in, I'm talking about elected officials. Uh, I'm not gonna, uh, I'll, I'll sort of divide between people who are elected officials in the Congress and the Senate. Uh, I think they're still solidly organized around policy. I think they are scared to death of what Joe Biden and the Democrats are about to do and could do uh, if they were given not just two, but four years. And so I think everything, everybody is interested in doing whatever they can to get the majority back to stop uh, what 
you know, Biden ran as a unifier. We just didn't realize when he said, I want to unify, he meant unify the Democratic Party, not unify the country. And in fact, that, and I think he said in an interview recently, his most important accomplishment is that he's unified the Democratic Party. Uh, again, that's not what he sold to the American public, but that's what he's done. And it's scaring a lot of Republicans into, you know, uh, in, into, you know, focusing on making sure that we're in a position to uh, to be a uh, a counter to uh, to the Biden uh, Democrats when they're up for election in 2022. Uh, now, having said that, there are some and they get a lot of publicity within the mainstream media who are Trump loyalists and they're Trump loyalists because they can raise a lot of money. Um, you know, it's look, I hate to say it, but there's a lot of politicians out there who uh, you know, think there's an I in team and, uh, and they're more focused on themselves than they are the team. And they are about what's right for the country because they're in many respects, they're, they're, they're like progressives because they think they're the solution, you know, that, that, that they have the solution and it's them. And that, uh, and, and now their solution is different than the progressive solution, but they're no different in the sense that, that they're the most important thing. And that, and that anything they, that, that helps them is good for the country. Uh, and there are people out there like that. Uh, I, I find it um, distasteful. And it, it, the, it's worse than distasteful because what, they, what the media does is take those handful and sometimes more than a handful of folks who are Trump sycophants and, and turn them into the voice and, 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 and face of the Republican Party. And say, you know, this is who the Republican Party is, uh, and uh, you know, you let's take the example of uh, of of the fight now going on with Liz Cheney. Uh, there's a legitimate, you know, I, I understand why Republicans are upset because they're trying. Most Kevin McCarthy and most of the Republicans are trying to hold together the Trump coalition, right? Uh, and and there are people, and that let me sort of move to the other comment, which is. The, the Republican Party, not just Republicans in Congress now, but let's look across the country. Donald Trump is, there, there are a lot of Republicans who are wedded more to Trump than they are to the party, more in the public than there is in Congress. Uh, and, and, and Republicans in Congress know this. And so, and, and the reason, by the way, I'm not, and I'm, I'm not being critical of people who are wedded to Trump. I think the reason they're wedded to Trump is because he fought and because he didn't, he didn't, you know, cower to the left. He he was willing to you know to 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 voice what for decades Republicans have sort of uh, you know I shouldn't say that. I mean, the revolution in '94. I mean, we fought, we did things, but you know, throughout a long period of time, Republicans have cowered to the national media. I mean, you look at John McCain and Mitt Romney are two great examples that you know Republicans voted for people who were not confrontational, uh, who wanted to uh, to have the New York Times like them, uh, and and Republicans just got, particularly the new brand of Republicans who came in, the blue collar conservatives who came in, you know, wanted none of that. I mean, you know, these people are actually trying to assault my family and my beliefs. And, and they're, they're trying to transform this country that I love. And, and someone's got to stand up and fight. Uh, and, and we didn't for a long time. And, and so I don't blame them for their loyalty to Trump at all. Uh, but members of Congress now have to deal with the reality that we need those folks to participate in the 2022 election. So going out there and poking the bear, as Liz Cheney is doing, while I agree 100%, let me just say this, I agree 100% with what her point, which is Donald Trump lied about the election being stolen. I said that on election night. When he came out at 2.30 in the morning, I was still on CNN at the time, he came out and said, you know, the election was stolen. I went on TV within 20 minutes. I, I don't know if I was the first, but probably at three in the morning, I probably was the first who said, yeah. you can't say that. That's not right. That's, that's not true. I mean, it may be true, but you can't say that now because you don't know it's true. And, and you know, I'm willing to give him the chance to prove it, but until he can prove it, he shouldn't say it. And he never did prove it. Uh, and, and as a result of that, what Cheney is saying is right. But to go out and make it the number one issue that you talk about is, is counterproductive. Uh, I think you know, we need to say the election wasn't stolen. We need to disrespectfully disagree with the president. Uh, uh, but we can't 
go out and divide the party and make that the focal point right. of, of, of this election. So if, if you're in the House, would you would you vote for a new Congress chair because of that, or would you I, would you figure out a way to? How would you? I try to you yeah, do? I try to figure out a way to uh, to you know to explain to the conference what I just explained here and say, look, civil wars don't usually help uh, in elections, and uh, you know we need people who you know we need we need to to bring people together. Uh, you know, Liz is right. I agree with her. But uh, the tactics she's using, you know, just because you're right doesn't mean what, you know, how you go about saying you're right is the right way to do it. Uh, and I don't think she's doing it in the right way. And, uh, and I think other Republicans, as I, you've heard me say, you know, this abject sub loyalty to Trump, uh, no matter what, whether it's true or what he's saying is true or false, is, is just as counterproductive for us bringing the party together as Liz Cheney is. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Rep. Jim Banks has written a memo. Uh, I don't know if you've read it or you haven't have. seen on it, but um, how how would you assess Jim Banks's read on what you articulated back in 2014? Yeah, I. Which I, I you wrong. Yeah, I I I love his memo, except one thing, and and this is a pet peeve of mine, but it's it 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 obviously was a pet peeve of Liz Cheney's because Liz uh, Liz. I think remarked on this was some sort of Marxist manifesto or something like that. Yeah, she thought she thought uh, was, she described Banks' memo as neo-Marxist. Neo-Marxist, okay. Um, and obviously, I don't. I would not describe it as neo-Marxist. But the the one thing that that was Marxist, and there's no question was, is the incessant use of the term working class. There is no class system in America. Let me just and and, and this is what. You know, infuriates me with sort of the tone deafness of some of our folks who go out and make these arguments. Uh, it, we play into the progressive Marxist uh, ideology when we start dividing America by class. Uh, you know, there is there is no class. There's no upper class. There's no lower class. Uh, there is mobility between them. No one. No one that I'm aware of ever looks at anybody and says, oh, you're, you're low class. I mean, that just, I mean, we're not India. I mean, this is, we're not a caste system. We're not, we, we believe in the, you know, the dignity and equality of every person. And when we use Marxist terms like working class as repeatedly as, as, as Representative Banks did, that's problem, that is highly problematic for me. Uh, that, 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 that just gives me the chills. So, on substance of what he said the Republican Party should be doing, 100%, you know, 99% with him. On style, 100% against him. And so, but, but it gives you the, it, it tells you something. When, when I don't, you know, Liz Cheney is not a blue collar conservative like I am, and I get that. I mean, she's, you know, she grew up in, you know, uh, you know in a different era, you know, with, with, her, with her dad, and, you know, she was part of, 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 of the Bush world and, and, you know, the Reagan world and, the, you know, the Ford, Reagan, Bush. I mean, she's been, you know, she's been with the establishment Republicans for a long, long time. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, she's a, she's a very principled conservative and I respect her greatly because of that. But, uh, you know, she's, she doesn't have the senses, sensibilities or sensitivity as to what, in my mind, as to how the party has changed. And, uh, and so I think, you know, maybe a, a little different uh, take on that would have been probably more called for, but I do understand how she got the neo-Marxist because uh, the whole talk of class is, is repugnant in my mind and counterproductive. Well, would, would Rick Santorum, the architect of blue collar conservatism be not eligible for leadership because you said Donald Trump lied about the election? Yeah, I you know I don't I don't think so. I mean, I think that I don't think the issue is that Liz Cheney is saying Donald Trump lied. I think the issue is that she is making that the centerpiece of of her uh, her persona right now. And I mean, I know other people say, well, you know, she fist bumped uh, Joe Biden. He's the president of the United States. Uh, you show the president respect, whether you agree with or not. I mean, I. Uh, that's it. I mean, that's you know, we 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 said that how many times when it came to Donald Trump? You know, show him respect. He's the president. If 
But now all of a sudden, if we show Biden respect, you're a traitor. I, th this is the kind of stuff that I just don't, I, don't, I won't give quarter to. And, you know, Liz Cheney is right to say what she has to say, but I think she's, uh, she's causing a problem for herself. And I think unnecessarily for the caucus by making this the centerpiece of, uh, of, her, uh, of her leadership in, in the Congress. Yeah, I think, I think just a, a note on the fist, the fist bump, you know, as I've reminded you and other, other folks is Tom Coburn, after oh, Barack, yeah. Obama Ever, yeah, yeah. Union, Barack Obama went down the line, he came up to Tom Coburn and gave him a bear hug on national television. Yeah. And I remember, in the moment, George Will was just taken aback. Why is, why are these two people giving each other a hug? And, uh, and Coburn took a lot of grief for that, but he, he didn't just double down, he tripled down and said, you know, he's, he's our president. We should be proud that we work for the president. Yeah. yeah. Really no, I mean, and that's, 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 yeah, that, that's the American idea. Exactly. And look, what, what, one of the things that I'm, I'm most just, I'm, I'm distressed about many things. Uh, one of the things I'm very distressed about is the, you know, the decreasing uh, civility uh, in, in our culture. And, you know, uh, I've seen it for 20 plus years with me, how, uh, the left and now social media just ad hominem, brutal, vicious attacks on anything I do or say. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's just, it's a blood, you know, social media and, and politics is just, it's just a vicious blood sport. And uh, there's no quarter for anybody, you know, to, you know, to make a mistake or to say something or it's, it's, I, I, you know, it's not healthy. It's not good for our, it's not good for our country. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that I'm working on with my good uh, old pal Foster Freeze, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're promoting, uh, you know, what's called harmony dinners and, and uh, you know, something called, we're, we're working on something called the coffee challenge, which is to challenge people from opposite ends of the spectrum to have coffee with each other not to convince each other one way or the other, but just to see the humanity of the other person and realize that, you know, yes, we can be foes, but we're not enemies. We're not, you know, we're not, uh, you know, we still, uh, we're still Americans and, and uh, you know, we, we should be able to be civil and disagree without, without being, you know, violently disagreeable. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I'm sitting here on a former Civil War battlefield. I mean, we, uh, our, our home, just a, a few feet away, uh, was a field hospital. Uh, there's a true story of this. This ha this property was owned by a Southern sympathizer family. Uh, they brought a, a, a wounded Yankee captain in, and one of the daughters said, "Don't treat, don't treat him. Let the damn Yankee die." Another another daughter intervened and said, "No, we're going to take care of him." So to make a long story short, is the daughter that initially refused to treat him, he came back and they got married after the war. <laughs> so, so it's a story. Today, today's enemies can become tomorrow's partners. Yeah. So I, I commend you and. And foster for that for that focus. I, so I want I want to touch briefly back on this on the issue of the election because this is a raw emotional issue for a lot of Republicans conservatives. So you're saying Trump lied about the election, and I agree with you. Liz Cheney saying the same thing. A lot of people are saying that. But as as you and I talked offline about Pennsylvania in particular, you have intimate knowledge of how that state works. It's important to note that there. It, and let, let me say what I think you've said to me, and you can say, say again, Bubba, is there there were maybe 10,000 votes that really were in question. And so you can you can acknowledge that there could have been enough fraud to make a difference. Yep. Had the yes. closer, there, that's a very important point to make. So because there are a lot of people that have good faith concerns about election fraud. So I want to be clear that even though we're seeing Donald Trump lie about the election, we're not saying it's not because I thought the election was pristine exactly. or that the Democrats didn't. This, it, it's less about the pristineness of the election and more about what the Democrats did to uh, to change election laws prior to the election. I mean, that's that's, you know, they use COVID just like they're using COVID now for for spending six trillion dollars. They use COVID to go out and convince courts and secretaries of states, and in some cases, uh, governors and legislatures to change the laws on how we are to vote. And almost, and in every case, lessen the, the, uh, the security of the ballot box. And they, they opened up uh, to allow more ways of voting and different things to happen, but they did it in a way because it was ad hoc and it was driven by Democrats. It did in a way that 
didn't uh, come along with the the opening. I mean, there's nothing wrong with with extending hours or or uh, early voting or whatever the case may be, as long as you do it in a way that's secure and that you that you that you that votes are trustworthy. And and so uh, it's it's really interesting. I know uh, I was talking about the the Census Bureau that uh, you know that the the highest uh, African American turnouts. Uh, you know, I think the highest one was, I think, Mississippi, Maryland, Maryland, Mississippi, uh, both Republican governors, I might add, uh, and, and Mississippi, well, you know, known forever as being the most discriminatory against blacks, yet it's had the highest percentage of black turnout uh, was in the state of Mississippi. So the idea that Republicans and conservative states, you know, don't want blacks to turn out is ridiculous. What they want is they want a, a balance between the availability of the vote and the security of the vote and the, and the trustworthiness of the vote, the validity of the vote. And, and, and by the way, again, all of the, all the, if you look at the Census Bureau data from the 2020 election, it's very, very clear. Uh, all of these laws that the Democrats say limit turnout or, or discriminate, <laughs> Those states just simply, there was no statistical difference between turnout in any of those states. In fact, they, you know, some of the lowest turnouts among uh, African-Americans were in, uh, in, uh, uh, in liberal states. Uh, I, I can't remember the state, but I think it was New Jersey. Uh, could have been, but it was one of the big blue states where the, uh, the turnout was roughly among Blacks was roughly 36% compared to 72% for Mississippi. So the idea that somehow or another that uh, the blue states, you know, encourage, you know, minorities to vote and red states don't, and, which is the premise that the national media uses to, uh, to convince uh, the minority community that Republicans are against you. Uh, African-Americans are for voter ID. They believe that people should have to sh sh prove who they are before they vote. This is, this is ridiculous to say that, and it's demeaning to, for Democrats to say that this is you know, racially discriminatory as if blacks don't have voter ID. I mean, this, this, is, this is the kind of stuff that, uh, that I understand how conservatives get pretty ramped up about it and, 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 uh, and how Trump, frankly, has gotten ramped up about it because you know, Democrats prior to the last election tried to make it easier to cheat. I'm just be honest. They they opened up opportunities to vote without the commensurate security uh, protocols in place, and that's what happened in Pennsylvania. I mean, Pennsylvania. Give you. I know it's a long answer again. But I apologize. But Pennsylvania, uh, they went to court. A Democratic-controlled Supreme Court basically ruled that the election laws could be changed to make it easier to vote, to let people vote, to have people's votes come in late. Even you know, there's a requirement they had to be in within by election day. No, they said, no, it can come in later. Uh, and, and, you know, there were other, other changes to the election law uh, having to do with fixing your ballots, things like that, that the governor changed. Uh, you know, when I say fixing your ballot, so if you sent a ballot in by mail and it didn't have it, didn't have a signature and it needed to have a signature uh, and under Pennsylvania law, you have to throw the ballot out. But the governor said, no, you can call the person and get them to come down and sign it. You can you can remediate the, you know, the uh, the the the, uh, the error that's against the law in Pennsylvania. And and uh, excuse me, that's against the law in Pennsylvania. And 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 so on many occasions, that's why I talked about all these votes that had the election been closer then you know, there, there would have been a grounds for it just to in Pennsylvania to say that the election was was not known. I mean, you can't, you, can't, you couldn't decide it. Uh, but that, but the election was 85 or 90,000 votes. And we were talking at most, as you mentioned, 10,000. So yeah, did, were there problems? There's a reason for people to be upset? Sure. But it wasn't the deciding factor in the election. So, so Rick, what I hear you saying is that the, the future of the, of the conservative movement, we should embrace blue collar conservatism, but we do not need to purge people who Want to, want to acknowledge the fact that the election wasn't stolen. We, we need to make room for those voices. Absolutely. I saying that. You got to make, look, it's yeah. the truth. I mean, are we, are we going to make room for the truth? Well, gosh, if, if the Republican Party, which I've always said is the party that stands behind the truth, 
as we best understand it, not as we want to remake it or as we want it to be, but as it is, uh, if we can't if we can't recognize the truth and that there has been no evidence to suggest that that there is sufficient number of votes that that Trump won the election, then then you know, what's the party then then how are we any different than the other side? We can we can sort of make create our own truth, our own facts. No, that's them. They want to create their own own, you know, as, as Justice Kennedy said, their own concept of reality. Uh, that's not us. Right, right. So when I was going through your book, you, you identify a few sort of to-dos. So I'm going to run these by you, uh, which you wrote, you probably remember, and just ask, how can we update these in okay. 2021? So, so your, your list was, you know, the agenda, number one, we need to focus on marriage, family, and community. It isn't enough. We, yes, we're the party, of, uh, we're, we're a country of individualism, but individuals exist in the, in the context of families and communities. Very important. Number two, healthcare. You, you and I have worked a lot on healthcare. Uh, we can't stop fighting for free market healthcare. Where again, the center of gravity is not the government, but individuals, education, uh, education choice, uh, industry and energy. We'll, we'll, let's, we'll circle back on that taxing and spending, and then finally messaging and communication. Uh, do you think that's still applicable? How would you update that if you were going to write a yeah, I mean, word of your book in 2021? Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, I, I still think, you know, four of those five were things that I think Trump, you could say that Trump was pretty, uh, uh, pretty tied to. The one that he wasn't that I think Republicans have abandoned is, is, is the issue of fiscal responsibility. Makes it hard for us to go out and talk about spending $6 trillion when we just spent two or three or $4 trillion. Uh, and, and, you know, I understand that it's a pandemic and there was, but, but even before that with, with President Trump, I mean, I agree with a lot of what he did, but he didn't really care about deficits or to care about spending. And, and that's, that's a, that's a big problem. And, you know, it's going to come back to haunt us at some point. Uh, you know, I don't know how long the Fed can keep interest rates at zero, uh, but you know, once they start to go above zero and we start to have to pay for this debt, it's not going to be pretty. And there's nobody who talked about that more than your old boss. Uh, so I, I, yeah. I, I, every time I think about debt, I think about Tom Cover. So I appreciate. Um, it. Yeah, absolutely. And so I, you know, most Republicans would probably back away from that, but I, I, I don't. I, I still think that's that's very very important. Um, you know. You mentioned, you mentioned, I don't know if I mentioned this and I don't know if you were reading verbatim what I was saying, but uh, the emphasis on education and school choice and uh, you know, taking the power away from government unions uh, to, to control the education and from the left to indoctrinate our children now in kindergarten with you know, uh, critical race theory. And th I mean, these are, this is really, really important stuff. And, you know, I, I talk to folks all the time and say, you know, well, you know, we might win in 2022, but uh, I forget who said it, but uh, I think it was one of the Greek philosophers who said, give me the storytellers and I will control the country within a generation. Right. Well, right. you know, if all the educators and all of the Hollywood and news media is telling a story that's not true, but telling a story of what America is and who we are as a people, then, you know, Try talking to young people about traditional values and or about you know what America is. I mean, uh, they the things that come out of their mouth they're just stunningly I hate to say stupid but ignorant. I mean, not at all based in 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 truth, and yet that's what they're being taught. And and so to me, we're sort of in a uh, in a real urgent moment here to uh, and and. I won't say thankfully, because you don't want to be thankful about a pandemic, but the pandemic sort of laid bare what the left is doing and, and what they really care about. And what they care about is power control. They don't care about kids. They don't want to put kids back in the classroom, even though they're suffering greatly, both uh, physically and mentally from, from that. They don't care. They care about their power base. They care about the unions. They care about government unions. And, and so, yeah, that would be, a again, that would be a really... I'd put that very high on the list these days of something that we've really got to focus on. Uh, and, and, you know, carry as a, as a real strong part of our banner. 
Yeah, and I think let's in our kind of final five minutes here, let's talk about the Biden infrastructure plan. Because again, as I mentioned, you focused on industry and energy. And again, this is in 2014. Yeah. You it, Republicans, as, as we've talked about a lot, have come a long way in terms of their willingness to acknowledge, yes, I think you know, human men are, are causing global warming to some extent. Uh, it doesn't mean you're not a skeptic. It means it means just that let's let's have a no regrets policy where let's you know assume that we're contributing to global warming and let's not add to it. Let's let's have a set of policies that are going to make the environment cleaner regardless of the threat level of what it turns out to be. Um, but you were you were ahead of this back in 2014. Right? I think we've seen that what the Trump administration did to allow greater use of, of uh, you know, permitting. Yep, natural gas. Greenhouse gas emissions went down. Greenhouse gas emissions went down after we withdrew from the Paris Agreement. So I think, you know, I think we're ahead of the curve. But as, as you, and I, I know you're working on the infrastructure kind of discussions behind the scenes with other members. What is your take on, on how Biden is framing this approach? What is the... Well, I mean, I, I, I'm, as you know, I'm, I'm, solidly committed to uh, to building infrastructure, whether it's roads, bridges, waterways, uh, even broadband. I mean, uh, all of those uh, you know, critical uh, pieces of infrastructure that connect people to make the economy work um, are, are very, very important part of, of, of what the government is involved with. I would argue in many cases more on the state level than on the federal level, but uh, you know, the federal government has, has had its hand in there for a while and, uh, and, and, and you know, has some role to play. Although, again, I would argue that this should be done more at the state level than federal level. Having said that, you know, one of the things that the federal government has done and that um, and continues to do to impede infrastructure is regulation. Uh, it, you know, Joe Biden, number one, has expanded the definition of infrastructure beyond any rational reason. Right. And I think Candle, I think there's enough Democrats to recognize that as much as I, you know, I, I'm for the family, you know, paid family leave is not infrastructure. I mean, that's just not, it isn't. Uh, and, and so you, you can't just throw everything you want in there and call it infrastructure. Uh, so that's number one. Number two is I haven't really heard much from the administration about, you know, if you recall the stimulus package that Biden was sort of overseeing back in, you know, 2009 and 2010. You uh, led the oversight effort on that. Well, that. you know, remember shovel ready projects. Well, it turned out shovel ready projects, you know, are probably still being built with infrastructure money from the from 2009. Why? Because of regulation. You know, you can't you can't say I'm for building infrastructure and then allow projects to be held up for 10 years uh, because of antiquated rules that have no, uh, you know, that, that you can look back at and say, okay, this isn't working. You know, we wanted to do this to make sure we protected the environment, but it's actually holding back environmental pro projects, right? Projects that actually improve the environment, they're holding them back because not in my backyard. Uh, or, you know, someone has, you know, a, a legal, you know, some legal complaint about a company or about whatever. So we've, we, we need to, uh, we need to address the issue of, uh, of, of regulatory review. And, you know, we don't want to obviously trample over people's rights, but we don't want to create the opportunity, which is clearly the case, that people abuse those rights uh, for purposes of, of, of uh, their own financial gain or for stalling projects that they just don't agree with, but that are in the public interest and what the public wants to do. So uh, that, that's the area that I have a huge question mark as to whether Joe Biden will stand up and lead on that. And to date, he is not. Yeah, and what else, what else could Biden do to make it bipartisan? What could he pull out from the current iteration of infrastructure to get Republican support? Well, look, I think if he did a traditional infrastructure bill, I, you know, I've listened to a lot of my former colleagues out there saying, you know, hey, look, we're, you know, we're, we're open to, uh, to infrastructure, we're, you know, roads, bridges, you know, waterways, ports, things like that, uh, broadband. Uh, and, and frankly, a lot of them said we're open to, uh, to, uh, to debt financing some of it because, you know, candidly, if you're going to debt finance anything, you debt, fin you debt finance a project that's going to be, have a youthful life of 50 years, you know, it makes sense to debt finance that. Uh, so they aren't saying you have to pay for all of it. They aren't saying that you have to, uh, you know, that, that we shouldn't do this. Uh, but, 
um, right now the president's going for everything. I and I, I think you're hearing at least I'm, I believe you're hearing from Democrats saying, yeah, we, we may have to break it apart. I know Joe Manchin has said that, but I think others are are sort of warming to that idea. And if they do break it apart into its component parts, uh, infrastructure is actually what would be considered a traditional infrastructure bill. I think you'll get a lot of Republican support uh, and hopefully bipartisan support for a program that's not just going to spend money tying up things in court uh, and, and spending our money on judge on, uh, on lawyers and, and, uh, and courts, but on actual projects. And, and to be clear, tax increases are not part of traditional infrastructure. No, well, I mean, yeah, they, they haven't been, but I think, I, I'll be honest with you, I think Republicans, you know, given, get, at least I could be wrong, given the debt, I mean, may, may look at, as they have been in the past, user fees sure. uh, ha, have always been uh, been something that, you know, whether it was a gas tax or whether it was, you know, other types of, of fees that are uh, a company infrastructure, uh, private public partnership, there's all sorts of ways to finance these things. Uh, and I'm not someone who says, well, the government shouldn't, you know, raise any money to do that. I think that, again, is somewhat irresponsible. But it's not a corporate tax increase. It's not a capital gains. That's not, that's not tied to the infrastructure itself. So I think financing it, whether it's through, you know, some sort of carbon tax or energy tax or something, because if you do a gas tax, you know, five years from now, what percentage of the of the uh, uh, of of the users of the road are going to be consuming gas? I mean, they may be, you know, electric vehicle use is obviously going up dramatically, and so they they get to use the roads for free. Uh, so that that's why you know, looking at different ways in which to finance this are are probably on the table, uh, but not a general tax increase. Yeah, yeah, and I think you know, and we're not we're not pro. You know, we're skeptical of the carbon tax. I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not advocating, I'm, not advocating, I'm not advocating for any of these, by the way. I'm just saying that those those are the things that I think could be on the table because they're related to the actual expenditure of funds. But yeah, but, but you're saying it's wholesale. Let's use this moment to dramatically increase taxes. non yeah. non I, It certainly will be a non-starter among Republicans as well, expanding, you know, expanding what infrastructure means. I think something more traditional has in the past has been supported by Republicans. I think there's a lot of Democrats who would like to pass something. And I, I, I hope that Republicans are to the point where they, you know, they are, uh, as the Democrats were for four years, they won't support anything that Donald Trump did. Sure. Uh, although in the end, they actually did. They supported, uh, you know, the, uh, the justice reform, uh, the, you know, the legal reform stuff. So, you know, I hope we're not as uh, as dug in that, that anything that Joe Biden wants, whether we like it or not, we're not going to vote for. Uh, I, I think we need to, you know, we need to do things to, to help the country. And I think this this would be one that could could do so. That's great. Well, Rick, thank you so much. You've been very generous with your time. I appreciate your leadership on this in so many fronts. And you can follow us at c3solutions.org and also our news magazine, c3newsmag.com. And there's a section on there called Voices, where you can see a collection of all the right voices. Uh, we'll be posting this uh, interview on Facebook and our, our podcast and look forward to joining you next time. Well, let me before you before you sign off, let me just give a, a little plug for C3 and, and the work that you guys are doing. And uh, I, it's, it, it is important that conservatives have ideas. You know, you and I have been working on healthcare for a long, long time, and I think one of the reasons we lost the election in 2020 was because the president wouldn't embrace a, a health reform measure that showed how we were going to actually cover people and make lives better for people, and uh, particularly during a pandemic, that to not support something like that to me was unconscionable. Uh, and you know, we had groups, think tanks, and others together trying to try to get. Uh, a consensus. I think we actually did get a consensus, but we couldn't get the president to, to support it. We couldn't get Republicans in Congress to, to go out there and really uh, vocally get behind it. And, um, mm -hmm. and that's that's a problem. We can't be, as you mentioned right at the beginning of the show, we can't just be the party of no. We can't be the party of not them. Uh, we, you know, Americans want to know, you know, what are you going to do to solve the problems that are real? And, and so, uh, the fact that C3 is stepping forward and providing, you know, the background information and and the support for, you know, intelligent solutions that that are going to make our our environment better, whether we like it or not, 
if you're under the age of 40, you have been schooled that global warming is the existential threat to the country. Uh, in, it's, I, it, I don't believe it is. I don't think it's an existential threat to the country, but uh, young people do and, and, and young Republicans do. And so again, we either face the reality that, that people care about this and want us to do something, or we face the reality that we're not gonna be making policy uh, in Washington for a long, long time. And I don't think, I don't think that's a good thing for the country. Well, I, and as we spelled out at the beginning, you do care. You've, you've, you've got your bees, you've got your land, and we believe in leaving the world better off than we can. So, so there's no doubt that we care. And I appreciate that and uh, look forward to continuing the work and uh, best of luck.